for us. Rev Shell is a metaphysical minister, clinical hypnotist, um, just an all around phenomenal healer. And I'm so glad that she agreed to join me for this call. Um, we are going to be talking about some pretty heavy duty stuff tonight because it's about childhood trauma. But the, um, at least the intention, because I had reached out to Michelle about having this conversation um, a couple of weeks ago. And, and my intention for wanting to have the conversation is really to, one, um, uh, provide a sense of hope that healing from childhood trauma is totally possible, mm -hmm. that you do not excuse me, have to be imprisoned by what you experienced as a child for the rest of your life. Um, so we're going to be starting first and foremost, just by giving you a little bit of information about who we are individually as healers and the type of healing services that we offer. And um, then we're going to both share our personal um, stories of having been uh, adult survivors of childhood trauma. And we'll, I, I have some questions that we're both gonna be um, asking and answering and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, providing some information and helpful tools that can be of, of service to you if you too are an adult survivor of childhood trauma. And we will wrap up by giving detailed information about how you can get in touch with both of us if you would like to um, you know, explore and delve further into your own healing process. So, so that's kind of the nutshell of what we'll be uh, talking about this evening. And I yeah. am going to extend the invitation graciously to Michelle to begin. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rev Shell, and I am a metaphysical minister. And really what that means is that I am a, a minister of the woo. Um, I am also a clinical hypnotist um, and a family constellations facilitator. And so those are the three tools that I use in my healing work, which really is centered around um, if we look with, with childhood trauma being the umbrella, I specifically focus on what we call the mother wound. And that is the wound that we have um, or that we uh, have in our life as a result of being overmothered or undermothered or having some sort of dysfunctional relationship with our mother. And so that's the, the focus of my work. And those are the tools that I use. And I'm sure we can get a little bit more in detail a little bit later on how those tools fit together and what like healing work with me probably would look like. Um, but that's pretty much in a nutshell what I do. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Um, can you share, um, and again, as much or as little as you'd like, um, your own story um, of being an adult survivor, what you experienced um, in terms of childhood trauma? Yeah. So goodness. Um, you know, I, uh, when I was a small child. No. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been um, before. Yeah. I was a little girl. So <laughs> I, uh, I, was um i'm a daughter of a i'm sorry about my dogs everybody's working at home these days somebody must have walked by the front door um <laughs> my chihuahua is really the guard dog um so i uh i was uh, born to um my mother when she was about 27 uh, but my mother um was i think developmentally not um, not where she should have been at that age. Looking back, uh, I have suspicions that my mother um, suffered from fetal alcohol effects because her mother was an alcoholic and I'm not quite sure when um, my grandmother's drinking started but the stories that I get really are all about um, her being an alcoholic from very early age so I'm I, I suspect that my mom while she didn't have fetal alcohol syndrome I think that she had fetal al alcohol effects which really impaired her ability to um, to make good decisions like she just didn't have that skill set uh, my mother was also um, the the oldest daughter uh, I'm sorry, 
my mother was the baby actually mm -hmm. i mean i mean yeah because my well i think she was the baby i actually have to go back and look at that <laughs> um anyway anyway the wound that my mother carried was that she was very rejected from her mom. Um, I don't think that my mom and her mom ever got along and my mother carried the wound of rejection her whole life. Mm -hmm. And what that meant for me was that my mother showed up to motherhood unable to nurture, unable to love, unable to bond, unable to provide basic um, care and connection and bonding that children needed. And so mm -hmm. um, myself and my siblings, we spent um, a lot of times in and out of foster homes. I was in and out of foster homes until I was about 13 my brothers and sisters all of my brothers and sisters except for myself were actually removed by the state of California and placed for adoption in other homes and so while I um, got pregnant at 13 had my baby at 14 got married at 14 that wow. was my escape everybody else uh, was adopted out by the state Wow. And so within that, you know, 14 years of my life, there was everything from, um, you know, straight up abandonment uh, as a young child being taken away by the state in and out of foster care, uh, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, all, I mean, you name it, it was probably there. Yeah. And so, you know, if we're talking about some of the assessments that are done on kids these days, we're talking about like the ACEs assessment, I'm a 10 out of a 10, um, or I have, I, I tested a 10. I assessed a 10 out of a 10. Yeah. Um, so if we're talking about how I sit right now, uh, I feel incredibly fortunate. I feel incredibly privileged. I feel incredibly blessed because somehow I made it out of all that. Yes. Um, I didn't come out unscathed and I can talk about some of the ways that that, that, that experience as a child really shaped my, my adulthood and even still some of the ways that I have to actively um, uh, walk in with it. I have to walk with intention in healing yes. because yes. it's, you know, there's, there's wounds sometimes that we can do a lot of healing work, but it's patterns and subconscious narratives that really keep our, those stories alive, not just in our mind, but really in our bodies. Yes. And so, you know, we, um, I feel really fortunate in that I got early intervention. I always remember, you know, as a foster kid back in the seventies and eighties, they were really, big on therapy and making sure that I went to group counseling and making sure that I had intervention. I don't think it's like that now. Um, no. I, I, mm. I, I, I feel like the system was less overloaded than it is now. And so there was this, mm. there was this uh, availability of services and resources that I don't think kids these days have. Right. Um, and right. I have this, this um, resiliency that I think came from the moments that I was in really good foster homes where I was able to really co-regulate and get um, love mirrored back to me from very yes. caring foster parents. Yes. Wasn't always the case, but I think those small moments of being able to feel what it meant to live in a normal home, to get love and affection and be cared for really made such a difference in the Absolutely. way even that I framed my experience. Yeah. So yeah, totally. that's, yeah, that's kind of my story, you know, as far as childhood. Yes. Yes. We can get into how it affected me as an adult later if you want to. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, and um, I guess I'll, I'll do the same. Uh, my, my name is Ama Tanya, and I am a holistic healer. And so what does that mean? It means that I work holistically with clients to attend to the physical, the emotional, mental, um, spiritual, energetic um, body, um, like, you know, Rev Shell was mentioning sometimes, um, oftentimes trauma is not just a psychological and emotional experience, but it's also carried on a cellular level in the body and energetically. So um, my story is that I've, I'm originally from Washington, D.C., born and raised in Southeast D.C., um, and my, my mother's side of the family originates from the eastern coast of North Carolina. So um, speaking of, you know, uh, family lineage and how these wounds are carried from one generation to the next, mm -hmm. my grandmother, maternal grandmother, was an alcoholic, left her husband for another man, abandoned her her children in the South for temporarily because she sent for them one by one. Um, and 
moved her children ages probably six, seven, eight years old. I think my oldest um, aunt was maybe in her teens when they were moved to, to the North. Back then, a lot of Black families migrated North from the South. So I came to be born in DC because of that migration. And, um, uh, you know, my mother's mom was a, a severe alcoholic, and so she died relatively young in her 50s. Um, and so being the matriarch of the family, the family kind of dispersed and kind of went their separate ways. Um, mm -hmm. Although we still kind of lived in the same vicinity of one another, like if my mom and I had an apartment downstairs, which I was my mother's only child. Uh, my aunt and her two children would be upstairs. Mm -hmm. So we were still a pretty close-knit family. Um, dysfunctional as hell, poor, um, poverty added to, you know, the experience of trauma. And during the 70s, there was a lot of experimenting with drugs and, you know, Mary Jane and all of that. And so that creeped into the family and became an issue. Mm -hmm. um, my mother... Uh, lived with clinical depression. And during that period of time, there wasn't a lot of education about mental illness and the proper treatment of it. So especially within the Black community, because it was so stigmatized. Yeah. Um, but my mother was in and out of the hospital a lot. And when she would go into the hospital because of a psychotic break, I would stay with a maternal aunt, her, her younger sister, mm -hmm. um, my aunt Maddie. And um, unfortunately, Maddie would, got really like strung out on drugs and mm -hmm. would beat the crap out of us, literally, mm -hmm. uh, myself and her two children. And so the nurse found bruising on me one day, took me out of the home. And that was my introduction into the foster care system. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate in that I didn't have multiple foster homes. Mm -hmm. I think my first foster home was with uh, a preacher and his wife. And then for a time I stayed with relatives, you know, we were kind of like, you know, I was tossed from this relative to that relative for the paycheck, the government social security yeah. check, you know. Um, so I experienced most of the physical and sexual abuse that I lived through with family, mm -hmm. which is not uncommon, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so um, my life wrath came with my final foster home with a woman by the name of Anna Mae Pfeiffer. Mm -hmm. And I love how you speak of you know, those snapshots and moments when you had um, mirrored back to you what love felt like mm -hmm. and what normalcy felt like. Yeah. Well, Anna Mae Pfeiffer, AKA grandma, because I had a choice. She told me, you can call me grandma or you can call me ma. I chose grandma, mm -hmm. um, was that for me. And I always credit grandma with being the first adult in my life who ever made me feel as if I was lovable, ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and she literally was, she, I truly believe her love saved my life as, as it did for all of her foster kids. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's my story. I can go on about other things as well, but that was my, um, experience of, of childhood trauma. So I'm going to ask you another question, uh, Michelle. What would you say is the one pivotal event um, that you experienced as a child that is responsible for shaping some of the dysfunctional life patterns that you experienced as you grew up? Yeah. You know, that's a hard one because I don't know, and I think especially understanding family systems in the way that I do, I don't know that there was like one thing. If I could have, if I could say that there was one theme uh, or there was one thing that I carried um, or that shaped uh, the 
future behavior of how I carried my childhood trauma, that one thing was not belonging and it was rejection and it was shame, right? Mm -hmm. So not belonging and rejection and shame has really, it shaped so much of my future in the ways that I would learn to love by giving away parts of myself the ways that I learned to connect by ignoring all of my needs and caring only for other people. Um, it was the way that no matter what I did to connect and belong with someone, it never felt real and whole. Um, it was this feeling like whatever space that I was in, I didn't belong there. And I think that that really came from going from foster home to foster home to foster home and really having that early imprint of, of this, you know, of not having that, that safe space to land, that uh, forever home, that constant yes. place where, um, you know, I knew was the, was the space that I could land and I just didn't have that. And yes. so, so much of my childhood and even a lot of my adulthood was spent trying to feel like I belong, trying to feel yes. like I fit in. And, um, and then dealing with the shame that came with that, like, why don't I fit in? Oh, I'm just different. And, you know, I'm just weird. And I'm not, you know, person that, you know, people are usually, I'm thinking they're like, why is she here? You know, I'm, I feel like I have felt like that most of my life. And yeah. really at the core of it, that feeling of disconnection, not belonging was from uh, the generational wound of yeah me not belonging with like not feeling connected and bonded with my mother and she was yes. not connected and bonded with her mother who was probably not connected and bonded with her mother so we're talking about three to four generations of women and girls who don't have that basic bonded connection and so while i felt like i didn't belong anywhere my mom felt she didn't belong in her family my great my grandma felt like she didn't belong with to her dad who was also an alcoholic who my nana didn't feel like she belonged and you know she moved around a few times so there's this trackable generational feeling of just not belonging and yes. that shapes so much of the things that i would do to get that sense of belonging yes yes yeah totally understand that um totally I can relate to that on so many levels um for me th it, there was that overarching theme of where do i belong and and in a sense of um of uh something being wrong with me there has to be something inherently truly fucked up about me yeah. and the reason that that was so deeply ingrained was based on i would say the one pivotal experience that really was like the driving force behind that negative core belief was the suicide of my mother mm -hmm. um and so um which she, she you know as i said she suffered with clinical depression and so she lost her battle to clinical depression and and took her own life when she was just 27 yeah. and i was eight mm -hmm. so um that message does something you know that 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 message says that if your own mother didn't want you who else would yeah. and so there must be something inherently wrong with you mm -hmm. it has taken me most of my adult life to heal right. that because it 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 um it was responsible for my sense of who i was and how i showed up in the world um uh speaking of which just to kind of uh, piggyback a little bit off of something you said about when um, going from foster home to foster home, even though I'm, I only had a handful, it was still enough to kind of set the, the deeply ingrain this message of not having a sense of stability, which on a cellular level, you never really come to complete rest. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost as if you always have your antenna out you know mm -hmm. am i being good enough am i going to be am I, will i have to pack up my trash my my hefty trash bag now and leave again mm -hmm. you know you never quite settle into a feeling of safety and security which mm -hmm. is 
a very basic foundational human need mm -hmm. that when it's not met, your foundation just for your very existence is off. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I wanted to touch on that because so much of some of the dysfunction and how it played out in my life was constantly moving. Yeah. I could never stay in one place for too long. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've moved in my life, probably close to, I would say, pushing upwards of 70 something times in my life. And I'm only 49. Mm -hmm. So you do the math. Yeah. Um, so, but those are some of the, um, uh, uh, negative um, impacts that resulted from that pivotal, I mean, yes. Was the abuse horrific? Yes. Was being sexually assaulted as a toddler horrific? Yes. And those memories were recovered later, mm -hmm. by the way. They were repressed memories that I recovered um, through therapy. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if I had to pinpoint the one defining moment would be my my mother's suicide. You know, it it, it shaped and colored everything. I can imagine. So, yeah. yeah. Um, let me see what my next question is for you. Um, <laughs> nice ask this question too. Yes, please, please, yes, do please. <laughs> do, do ask away. What do you? This is a I know really this question. Question. Yeah, I think this is a good time to kind of segue into as an adult survivor, like what our triggers are and how, so one of the questions that you had was as an adult survivor of trauma, we become acutely aware of both what our triggers are as well as our coping mechanisms, which help us manage them most uh, of which we developed uh, that helped us survive the trauma that we endured as a child. So like mm -hmm. what triggers do you have that, um, uh, you know, and I've got interesting ideas about triggers, right? But yeah. really, I think what this is saying is what coping mechanisms did you have to create within you and in your life just so that you could survive? And then how yeah. did they become triggers for you later on in life? Yeah. You know, that was a question that kind of came up spontaneously as I was, you know, just kind of, you know, trying to shape what we would talk about. Uh, and yeah. I really had to sit with that because I was like, um, so much of the healing um, that I've delved into over the years, over the past 20 plus years, it's been a journey for me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't have as, I recognize that I don't have as many triggers now as I did early on in my life. Mm -hmm. But I will say that, um, uh, anything, when I was in relationship with people, whether it was a friendship or a romantic relationship, mm -hmm. any indication, whether it was like totally distorted or not, that someone was possibly getting ready to leave triggered the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, my anxiety would go from a zero to a 10 instantly. Mm -hmm. They could just be going to the store. They could just say that I'm going to, you know, go see my mom for the weekend. This happened a lot with my ex-partner. I would be in sheer, like, panic mode until she came back through the door after the weekend. Yeah. That's how triggered I was with the fear of being abandoned. And so one of my coping mechanisms that wasn't very healthy, actually, was um, using food as, mm -hmm. as, as, to, to soothe, to self-soothe, and to, you know, stuff emotions. I did a lot of emotional eating mm -hmm. up to the point where I was pushing almost 300 pounds at one point in time in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and through healing and working through, you know, the use of food, because I could like, just numb eat. Um, I could wake up in the middle of the night and be because my anxiety was high, I would be half sleep snuffing like Oreo cookies down my not half sleep, mm. stuffing Oreo cookies in. Um, so I really had to you know, work with my food addiction and look at how I used food um, to, to self-medicate. Mm -hmm. 
and mm -hmm. to self-soothe and to deal with my anxiety and my fear of being abandoned. Um, and obviously that's changed a lot and I no longer um, use food in that way. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I will say that the other coping mechanism that I that was healthy that I learned to use was a lot of self-talk. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of self-mothering early on, yeah. mainly because I had to. Um, when you're getting the crap beat out of you, being, um, uh, you know, stuffed away in a room alone by yourself for hours on end, yeah. um, mm -hmm. uh, defecating on yourself and having to clean yourself up because nobody's there to do it for you. Yeah. You learn mm -hmm. how to self-talk to yourself. Yeah. And that's been something that I've used throughout my life. I still use today. I, I reaffirm positive messages by self-talking to myself. So if I feel like my anxiety is high or like say something happens, you know, um, uh, physically I'm not feeling well or something, I'm just going to use that as an example. Mm -hmm. I can hear myself is say, okay, it's okay, Tanya. It's okay. It's okay. You're, you're doing good. You're doing good. Like literally that's a, a, a coping mechanism that I learned when I was so little and I still do that to this day and it helps it helps bring my anxiety down yeah um, several notches what, what a beautiful awareness at such a, a young age um, because so often um, you know as kids who are experiencing those kinds of, of um, you know that kind of abuse we will internalize that and um, just move into self-hatred. And it's so easy to do that, but what a, a, a skill of resilience that you had so early to, to know that you were the one responsible for soothing yourself. And um, it's hard, you know, to say that to a, a child who shouldn't have to do that, but it did become such a, a useful and necessary skill as you started to walk through your your healing path as an adult, I'm sure. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think for me, um, so what I really took uh, from childhood into my adult life was codependency, and I took it in a big way. So whenever I would go to a new foster home, um, mm -hmm. well, let me step back. So I wasn't the oldest daughter. I was the second to the oldest daughter, but I was the oldest daughter in the home. When, so I have an older sister who was um, pulled away from the home when she was six. She was placed for adoption. She was, she was no longer, uh, uh, she was not in our, with our family anymore when I was born. So I never really knew her. Okay. Um, I know of her. We are connected now, like on Facebook. And, you know, I know my nieces. But as a child, I didn't know her. So I was the oldest in the home. As the oldest in the home, of a uh, of an addict, we become responsible for everyone and everything, mm -hmm. and even so much to the point was not only was I taking care of my mom when I needed to, I was taking care of my brothers and sisters when I needed to. I was covering for her addiction. I was making up the stories for school. I was, you know, making sure that nobody knew what was happening as much as I could because it was up to me to keep the family together. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the final piece, like it was the culmination of. Uh, my mom's, uh, like the deepest part of her addiction, where I had left, I had gotten married already. She was in a really bad way. My brothers and sisters were there and they were finally removed from the home. My mother called me um, and she said, it is your job to keep your brothers and sisters together. Do not fail us as a family. And I remember I had enough awareness at that moment um, and it might've just been sheer, um, uh, rebellion almost where I said that is not my job I'm not gonna do that I just started my own family I have to I have to take care of my own family that didn't mean that I didn't feel every word that she said in my body because I had always known that it was my responsibility to take care of everybody right yeah. but in that moment I stood my ground and I said it's not my job my brothers and sisters found homes and they found their path and they are living their fate and um, I honor them in their fate I did not rescue them but what I did do was transfer that over to everybody else, right? Gotcha. So um, 
what I did, ended up doing, and my biggest trigger is feeling like things are not in control. I wasn't like, I didn't need things to be perfect. I wasn't a control freak in that I had to have like this perfect aesthetic in my life. But if I felt like who I was with or the family that I was existing in, or, or, you know, even my kids as adults, if I felt like they weren't doing it right in the way that I knew could get done, because I had been on my own since I was 13, I knew how to get shit done. I knew what needed to happen and nobody else knows better than me, right? Cause that's, that's the existence that I had to live in. So anytime anything started to go awry, my codependency would kick in in high gear and I would take charge and I would make sure stuff got done and I would make sure that everybody had what they needed and I would do that to the point of exhaustion. Mm. And I remember like in foster homes as a kid, I was the one who would make sure all the kids were taken care of if we were in a mean foster home, right? So I would yeah, take yeah. them under my wing and I was the mama bear and I was the one that made sure everybody ate yeah. and everybody's hair got combed. And, you know, it was just this, that's just who I was. And so of yeah. course, I'm going to yeah. take that, you know, yeah. I become yeah. the helpful one. I become the compliant one. I become the one that makes their life easier so I can belong. And yes. with my own family, it was just the way that I ran my home. Like I just controlled everything um, in that I knew that the only way it could get done right is if I did it. So where that really blew up for me was, um, you know, in relationships with my children and trying to fix really what they needed to walk themselves. Yes. And situations in their life and choices that they needed to make. And mm -hmm. here I was mama coming in to try to save everybody. And really that was not what should have happened. You know, right. Should, right. we need to let our adult children go into their own life and make their own decisions. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, one completely separated from the family and, and we're, is very estranged. And, you know, I think we're slowly working on trying to come back, but there's this whole bunch of, layers there that we have to as a family you know dissect and go through mm -hmm. um with my daughter it was about me rescuing her because i didn't feel like i felt like i needed to right like she needed me too when in fact it was probably the worst thing that i could have done for her right right yeah so yeah. And, you know, even in my marriage there are ways where you know um i will take on all the responsibility and my wife is like you know you don't have to do that you don't have to cook for us every night in quarantine it's okay we can feed ourselves and i was like <laughs> <"That is okay." laughs> exactly and right. it's so funny i think that might be a common I, I don't know, but I think it might be a common um, uh, thing for uh, adult survivors to chop do because I've had that mother mother thing in me, even though I'm not a biological mom. I've mothered, I can remember, you yeah. know, because I had to mother my mom whenever she would be like Absolutely. in, you know, um, yeah belly of her depression she was totally incapacitated yeah. so yeah. I you know it was all about I can remember this one particular time remember how we used to have those um, bake sales at school yeah. yeah so I bought the I don't know if you remember those little snow globes where you shake in the snow um, oh, yeah. I bought her one of those with my little 50 cents or whatever from the school bake sale I think it was in first grade yeah, and it was yeah. around the holidays and I was supposed to wait until Christmas, but I ran all the way home because I wanted to give it to her, you know, because I thought it would make her happy, you know, yeah, sure. it would, that would make her happy. Mommy won't be sad. And mm -hmm. so um, that caretaking part of me, I think, got ignited, you know, as a, an adult uh, yeah, child yeah. Of childhood trauma it came from having to take care of from a very, very young age. Um, and so, I mean, it's a natural part of me. It's a good thing to, to want to, you know, be there for others, but it can be dysfunctional. It's funny. I, said, um, and I, I, got, I got this from notes that I was taking in over the last few years of, of doing some of my schooling and training, but um, I actually posted this yesterday on Instagram where it says children are loyal and innocent and they'll take on their parents' pain and suffering at a great cost. Because if mommy is okay, then maybe she'll give me what I need to be okay. 
And so this really is the genesis of so yeah. many of our adult issues because we yeah. just do, it's like we, in, you know, children, we are so loyal, so innocent at that time. And, you know, not only are we, con are we continuing the family narrative of how people belong and how people connect that happened and started well before we came into the picture, right. but we're also going into survival mode and everything that we do is so that we can feel connected and that yes. we can feel loved and nothing yes. else because if anything is wrong we automatically assume it's our fault and then we automatically assume that it's our job to fix it that's right and so that's right. you know if we do not have that parent that comes back in and says sweetheart this is not your job mommy's going to take care of her let me love you right if we don't have a parent that does that co-regulation and that um, mirroring of love and security we will take that into adulthood Yes, until it for just slaps sure. us in the face, for be, sure. Yeah, because it will. You know, we'll yeah. get to that point where um, it has wreaked havoc in everything in our life, just like yeah. an addiction, like you know, alcohol or drugs or food. It will wreak just the same amount of havoc. Um, yeah, we give away so much of ourselves that we don't have anything left for our exactly our existence. Exactly. Yeah which is a good segue actually into the um, next question about um, what I can share for me was my rock bottom mm -hmm. was um, having, you know, my mom having suffered with clinical depression, I inherited that from her. And so I struggled most of my teenage years, my, my young adult years, I was like really severely depressed. I didn't know what it was. I hadn't been properly diagnosed yet. I hadn't been started on medication or in therapy or any of that. And so my rock bottom was literally having a psychotic break and being um, hospitalized for two months. Um, and I was in grad school when that happened. I was at Temple in Philly and I had just graduated from nursing school at Howard, went straight into graduate school, probably was not the best idea and had a psychotic break. And it's the best thing that ever happened to me because it catalyzed my healing in earnest, you know all of the trauma that I had been holding and carrying with me year after year after year, um, all of the kind of mustering up the willpower to deal with it and to not have my childhood rob me of my future, it just all came crumbling down because I needed to deal with it. I needed yeah. to heal it. Um, so that was my rock bottom. What was yours? really good question um i'm gonna be honest with you it's really hard for me to to pinpoint one rock bottom moment i think um there were moments in my life where i was like what the heck was i doing right um i i you know i i think because healing for me was framed uh so early in my life as a necessity right? Therapy was always a part of what I was, um, uh, of the scope of the healing work that was available to me. Like I was always in therapy. And so um, because I got that foundation, I think whenever I felt myself slipping into um, whatever was going on at the moment, slipping deep into it, I was able to pull myself out of it. You know, I look, I, I you know, in my 20s, I lived in Vegas. I did a lot of partying in my 20s in Vegas. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I never like moved into an addiction, but you know, God, we did a lot of weekend partying, you know, in Vegas. If, yeah. You know, take up what I'm throwing out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I was lucky that because of my family history, I didn't move into that. I was always able to live right above the surface and go, okay, you know what, I'm done. I'm good. You know, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm done with that now. And I, I move on to the next thing. I think the, the biggest pain that I had in my life um, that I carried for the longest time, you know, besides what I was dealing with, with my, you know, just caring from my childhood and my disconnection from my mom was how that also played out in the disconnection with my own children and the divorce that I experienced with their father in the separation that I had with them for a long period of time and in the ways that I didn't fight for them in the way that I thought that I should have. 
Um, in that time, I carried a lot of grief and a lot of shame and a lot of um, a lot of pain around, you know, not only not being able to show up for them in the way that I wanted my mom to show up for me, but also in just the, you know, the, the haunting of, oh, they must miss me and I miss them. And what am I doing to them? And that pain lived with me for a long time. And it would take me years to be able to sit with the choices that I made, but to also understand how the systems that were at play within my family, within, his, within their father's family, and how those all played into the narrative that really was running and um, continuing this um, pattern within my family of women being disconnected from mothering. It was a systemic pattern that I didn't even know was there. Yeah. You know, I knew that like my mom, you know, she didn't raise her kids. I, I was now repeating the same thing for quite a few years and I knew that happened. But when I got into the work that I'm doing now, where I'm really, I map the trauma and I map the narratives and the generations of trauma within families, I'm able to see how really <laughs> systems marry systems yes. and they continue narratives until somebody stops to heal it. And so That's somebody right. says, okay, yeah. this is where the pattern stops. And yeah. I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure that this narrative does not continue forward in our family. And it wasn't until probably in the last three years where I started doing that really deep body centered healing work that yes. I really understood all of that, where I could even go, you know what? I tremendously love my mother and I have no animosity towards her. Um, that, that is an expanded place of compassion that I had to work to get because yes. when I started, it was like, <laughs> put her across the street. Like we would do visualizations, yeah. right? And, and yeah. one of the visualizations is how close can your mom come to you? And I was like, she could stand across the street. I don't want to have nothing to do with her until right. I was able to truly understand what she did and didn't have. Yes. She came into to parenting me. And that just yes. expanded the amount of compassion that I had for her, for myself, even for the, my children's father and the anger that I carried about the ways that that came to be. There was so many layers, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when I started really addressing that body-centered pain and what it yes. meant and how long it had been going on in my family, it wasn't yes. until then that I really saw... Um, the work and how far I had come. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, Michelle. Yeah, I, and and I'm so glad that you mentioned that about the body centered approach because for me, um, I, I attended a healing school by the name of Full Spectrum, mm -hmm. and I was a part of that community for a total of about eight years but I attended the school and, and delved into my own healing process for a, a four year period. And it was within a group context. And um, it was with like-minded individuals who like myself had some work to do on themselves, um, maybe not necessarily healing from trauma, but we delved into somatic work where you work with the body. We learned about energy work. We did a lot of experiential exercises as a group in partnering with one another because sometimes, um, you know, healing goes beyond the verbal stage. Oh, and it has to come into a very um, embodied process because a lot of the wounding is so deeply buried on a cellular level that you're not even consciously aware of it. Oh, yeah. So a lot of the work that I do as a holistic healer invites clients into the body so that they can access that material that's carried on a cellular level and that's carried on an energetic level. So that true healing and the depth of that healing can be catalyzed beyond what you can just verbally express. Mm -hmm. So um, I know for me, and I hear that you, you know, were in therapy from the time you were young, I probably started therapy, I'd say as a teenager. Um, so I didn't have as much access to it early on as a child. Mm -hmm. But um, I've been fortunate that 
I've had the opportunity to experience holistic ways of healing. Mm -hmm. And that's been um, so deeply impactful and helped me tremendously in my healing process in a way that just talk therapy probably wouldn't have done for me, to be honest with you. Not that it doesn't have its place and it doesn't have its benefits. It certainly does. Um, But I'm very much an advocate for um, holistic approaches that utilize um, kind of off, off the cuff modalities, you know. So mm-hmm. the breath, um, for example, um, and um, you know, energy work for for sure mm-hmm. um, can uh, help to shift and to clear blockages that trauma, you know, um, kind of has taken up residence within your being and you're not even aware of it so yeah Yeah. so tell us a little bit and you can ask me any questions too if something comes up don't let me halt the conversation Um, share a little bit about how people can find you and what um type of work you would do with them depending on, I guess, what they present to you? Yeah, so I'm just gonna take it back just a little bit and talk a little bit about how I came to into the work that I do and how okay. it all fits together, because I think once you understand that, then it can, um, then the rest of it makes sense. So um, I was I, I, four years ago, I lived in DC uh, with my wife and um, we made a decision to move to Texas. Good old Texas. <laughs> <laughs> It's complete, complete shock, uh, but yeah. it's just different, right? It's just not good, bad, it's just different. You know, okay. we can talk about the politics of it, but whatever, that's not this show. Um, <laughs> don't get me started. <laughs> right, right, exactly. We had that conversation. <laughs> but when I moved here, um, you know, I had been in finance my entire career, um, oh, finance, wow. administration, that kind of thing. And um, when I moved here though, I was at this really pivotal point in my life where I knew that I wanted to change what I, what I was doing as a career, what I wanted to do. You know, I, I, I wanted to be something different as a grown up, right? Um, so when I got here, I got here maybe in like fall of 2016, by January of 2017, I had, had enrolled in hypnosis school. And I was oh, in a hypnosis wow. program for a whole year and I learned advanced, um, you know, master level tech, techniques for cellular level healing and hypnosis. And so um, it was a fascinating program for me. I learned so much about the way that the mind works, the way that the mind and the body are connected, how we are, you know, really, really about what it means to be a a triune being of mind, body, and spirit, and how they all work together. Um, and so when I was done, I opened up my practice and, um, I started seeing clients. I knew that I wanted to focus on, uh, women, uh, and their trauma and healing because of my own background. I mean, why not just do what we know, you know? Yes. yes. So I started that practice and, um, I was, you know, going and chugging along. I had a podcast. I think you were on my podcast yes. called The Healing Toolbox. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, it was a, a, a podcast about, um, building your healing toolbox so that if something comes up within you, you have resources and tools that you could go and grab and start to implement right away. So I, one of the women that I wanted to interview uh, was, um, her name was Joanna Lynn and she ran the Family Imprint Institute. And um, I had a conversation with her before the recording. And by the end of that conversation, I knew that I wanted to enroll in her program to learn trauma, family trauma mapping and family constellations. The work she does is based off of uh, a, a healer who has long past, passed, he passed last year actually, but his name is Bert Hellinger. He is the founder and the creator or really the expander of the family constellation therapy work. Um, and then, um, he had a gentleman that studied under him by the name of Mark Wolin. Mark Wolin wrote a book called It Didn't Start With You, which is a book that changed my life completely. And I highly recommend anybody who wants to get into generational work, yeah. whether it's on yourself or other people, read that book because it is life shifting. Joanna Lynn was a student of Mark Wolin's. And so I knew um, that she was well-trained. She had a, you know, a, a, a amazing pedigree of 
of um, training and knowledge behind her and within her. And before we got off that call, I, I was like, where do I enroll? I went through her training class for another year to learn family um, mapping and constellations. And, you know, we enroll in training programs and we're like, I'm going to learn this new thing. Right. <laughs> that cracked me open. Like I'd never been cracked open in my life. Like <laughs> I was not, I was not prepared. I was not yeah. ready. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was ready. That's I was it. Ready. That's I'm it. In control. I'm in control. I'm in control. Right, right. I'm in control. Right. Girl, let me tell you about the ways my soul feels. <laughs> and she's so gracious and so full of. Uh, yeah, she's a beautiful space. spirit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she really does. And so yeah. I finished her program and about halfway through her program, I felt um, really drawn to expand the work that I did with women to focus in on using uh, mapping, the systemic mapping of the family and the generational trauma, pair yes. that with family constellations, which is an experiential healing process that allows you to take that story that you carry about your family inside of you, really to bring it out of you and yes. move it into resolution, resolution using yes. the body. Yes. And then as, yeah. Cause that's the important piece. You know, when we yes. can't complete an emotion because we don't have the ability to, because we can't, because we're not safe to, yeah. or whatever reason our trauma builds up, yeah. we have to complete that emotion. And that, yes. is, that is completing and re resolving our trauma. So it has right. to be body centered. Yes. And then as a hypnotist, what I was able to do then, almost like the icing on the cake and the cherry on top of the, of the cupcake, is hypnosis then, if mapping and constellations works in the family system, hypnosis then works in the personal subconscious to reshape mm. the neural pathways on how you carry that whole story so that you can create a new story yes. from a body-centered way, learn to yes. reparent the little girl in you, and then walk in autonomy and personal power again. So that's yes. the healing work that I do and how it all Beautiful. fits together. So, Beautiful. Yeah, I love it. I have I will never do anything else. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I have finally found my purpose and it feels good to be walking in that. Yes. Now, how do I shape that so that people can work with me? Private mm -hmm. sessions, I do private session work. Um, but I also have this year, I'm super proud of myself. I've written, <laughs> I've written two workbooks. <laughs> Oh, awesome. Yeah. Congrats. Congrats. Two workbooks, one that plays into the other. So one is called Your Body Holds Your Mother Womb, which is a, uh, a workbook that really, it's, it's not about resolution. It's about getting familiar with the ways that your body holds emotion and yes. really to start to move into that place where you're preparing yourself to get into resolution. And then that, so like a bridge, uh, kind of a transition. A bridge. Yep. It's it's, you know, so an example is uh, I've got 10 worksheets in there. There's a statement that I know anybody who carries a mother wound probably can relate to. So let's just say uh, the statement is um, uh, I overly involve myself in the care of others, often to my own detriment, right? Mm -hmm. so I want you to sit with that sentence and I want you to say it out loud and I want you to be aware and notice how it sits in the body. What emotion comes up for you? What sensations start to come up for you? What yes. story are you drawn to? How grounded are you? What is happening that you can notate, right? So this is a whole worksheet that you do. Mm -hmm. And then I've got body check-in and breathing exercises, compassion exercises so that you can regulate right. during the process. In that, you can start to put some of the patterns together because I've got some worksheets to help you walk through that. And then you can move into my big workbook, which is called Mapping Your Mother Wound, which really is a self-paced process of the whole family mapping process that mm. allows you to walk through putting together the families or the stories in your family tree and starting mm -hmm. to put together those dots, starting to understand why you do that thing that you do. Yes. With that, um, you is, and then so that then leads into the group constellation work that I do. So anybody who is doing the mapping your mother wound work, once you're done with that, then the next process is to start to work that out in constellation, which I do online and in groups. And um, and then I all that work I also do individually with people. 
That's awesome. That's phenomenal and such a powerful uh, process and it's a fully embodied process. Um, myself, the, the healing process uh, for me started with full spectrum and like I said, being a part of the school for four years and delving into my own healing process. Um, but then I stayed on for an additional four years as a, a in the teacher's program, I guess you could say, to, to go into more depth about the healing process. And that was hugely beneficial for me. Um, in addition to that, I've been blessed to work with um, alternative healers outside of full spectrum, both in mm -hmm. Peru as well as here stateside. Mm -hmm. So I've been fortunate in, in terms of learning more in-depth um, uh, techniques about how to work with people energetically. Mm -hmm. But the other piece of this, and I failed to mention this actually when we were sharing our stories, is that since I was a very young child, I've had the gift of um, sight, of being mm -hmm. able to connect with the realm of spirit. Yes. And so my gifts of mediumship and being able to connect with those who have transitioned from the body has always been an integral part of my life. And as I've developed my healership style, it's been a part of my healing services as well. Mm -hmm. So some of the ways that I work with people, I work individually one-on-one -on -one with people in sessions and work. Um, it's a combination of traditional talk, I guess you could say therapy, where we look at some of the core issues that are a source of suffering for you in your life. Mm -hmm. But I also um, include very experiential exercises as a part of the session mm -hmm. that invite you into the body so that you can access again that trauma and the wounding that is deeply buried on a cellular level that just talking about it cannot get to yeah. so um, that happens one-on-one -on -one, but I also offer healing retreats and um, with the whole corona thing that's been very interesting is kind of you know put a halt to that because we were supposed to have a the next uh, love heals retreat was going to be in june so that's yeah. on the yeah. right now but i find that the group process number one relationship is like totally the best healer because mm -hmm. we mirror to each other mm -hmm. and trigger the heck out of each other and bring up stuff. <laughs> you know, you throw us all in the cooking pot together and it's like, man, <laughs> no, you need to know what's for your healing. It's going to come up. Mm -hmm. So I, I love working in the group process because of that. Yeah. And yeah. so the healing retreats that I offer um, are for groups and, and it varies. I've had as, you know, very small intimate groups of six people. I've had upwards of 20 to 30 people in a group. So it just really depends. Um, as a part of the healing uh, retreats, I invite other healers into the process. I've learned to do that <laughs> because number one, I don't wear the healing cap for all people. Yeah. And yeah. people have different gifts and what they offer in healership can add to that container that we create together for the weekend. Mm -hmm. So um, that's some of the, the, you know, kind of the nuts and bolts of how I work as a healer. I do offer intuitive uh, readings where I connect to the other side with people's loved ones as well. I've been opening more to offering that um, as a part of my healing services. I was resistant to it for a long time because it requires so much energy mm -hmm. because you're literally shifting dimensions. Yeah. Um, I don't yeah. Think, yeah, I don't think people realize just how much energy it requires to connect with the other realm. But um, after much nagging, I will say from the realm of spirit, I've decided to, to make that available for people who would like just additional guidance, or maybe they want to see if someone from the other side comes through for them. Um, I do offer mediumship, so chart readings now. Um, so as a part of the healing services that I, that I offer. Um, that piece is so important because so much of what we carry is, is 
is based on um, people who, you know, may or may not be with us in life anymore. And sometimes that, that ability to connect with someone in spirit is incredibly healing. One of my favorite teachers is also a medium and um, the work he does in helping people heal from grief is just tremendous. Like you, yeah. it's a service that you, you don't get from, you know, anywhere else. And so that yeah, service yeah. is so valuable and your clients are so lucky to have you oh, um, thank you. send that to them because it is such a compassionate yeah. place and such a needed place. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And thank you for saying that because, you know, I kind of joke about the resisting of it. I, and that's a whole nother show. We can talk about, you know, how to develop your, your particular intuitive gifts, because it is a process. That's a process in and of itself, you know, to uh, learn what your gift is and how to become familiar with it and comfortable with it, because you can say no to it, you know, and I've, I've known, um, you know, psychic intuitives and mediums who have done so. Yeah. But I've chosen to say yes, because of what you just said. And, yeah. um, and I see the benefit of it. I see how people walk away completely comforted because they know that in another mm -hmm. realm, their loved one is still very much alive. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you for that. Thank you yeah. for that. Yeah. Absolutely. But well, <sighs> okay, so this is how can people find you if they want to work with you? Because I don't think we gave that and I need to get my two. So how can people find you? So I, my website is www.lovehealz, not the, not the Tar Heels. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was like, I tried to put that in. I said, how did you spell it? H-E-E-L-S, not Tar Heels. Oh, I thought you loved the Tar Heels. No, first of all, I don't even love sports. So love heels, H E A L S, the number one at yahoo.com is my, no, not at yahoo. Love, that's my email address. You can email me to love heels one at yahoo.com. But my website is www.loveheels1.com. Mm -hmm. And there you'll see the smorgasbord of all of the different um, healing services that I that I offer. Um, mm -hmm. I did want to add that um, my goal, because I'm currently working on my PhD in clinical psychology, mm -hmm. is to ultimately uh, open a private practice as a clinical psychologist and specialize in working with adult survivors of childhood trauma. So that's my mm -hmm. professional goal. Yeah. Um, my present life is as serving as a holistic healer, though. So awesome, awesome! I know that's a journey. PhD path is definitely. I know. I have a. My wife is on it currently. <laughs> Tell her hallelujah, amen. I understand. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> her for the whole school year mm -hmm. so we'll up in, the, in the summer <laughs> have compassion please yes yes <laughs> uh, okay so people can find me at my website uh revshell.com just like it's kind of spelled here in the video just with no period all put together revshell.com i'm the same at instagram at revshell um any of those can lead you to um to the work that i do and uh, shell at revshell.com if you want to email me or you can, you know, the best thing to do if you're interested in talking about how uh, my services can, can support you is to book a consultation with me and you can do that right on my website. Yes, and that uh, you can do that as well on my website. Um, I do do uh, 30 minute free initial consultations just to see if we're, you know, we would be a good fit to work together. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Because I'm not for everybody. Right? That's right. That's and I right. I work with everybody. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So, you know, we, we need to chat and make sure we're a good match because um, if I'm not for you, I want you to get the support. And I know That's a network right. of healers that I would be able to refer you to. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, well, yeah. I'm glad we finally got it going. <laughs> Because that was a feat. Look, we were really, our, our childhood trauma was really the intense. <laughs> Girl, <laughs> I can see, but show, I can see you were like, listen, no, we got to get this out. And I'm over here breathing, Lord, please. <laughs> you see how I can cope things, though? <laughs> I have to.
to intentionally keep that in check. And on her I was, just track, like, I was like, I'm not going to lose it. I'm not going to throw in the towel on this tonight. No, no, no. <laughs> like, you got it. Just let's take a breath. Just do what uh -huh. I say. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. <laughs> oh, Lord, you got to laugh. On, you got to laugh. IC Live. Yeah, now we know we just got to use headphones to our phones, but we're, we're good. I have recorded yes. it. I will send it to you. So if anyone missed this on, you know, we'll be able to, to share it every, uh, everywhere we need to share it. Uh, okay, very good. Thank okay. you so much for doing this. I Thank really you. appreciate you. you. <laughs> I enjoyed that. All right. Okay, thanks for joining us, guys, and thanks for hanging in there with us. Thank have you, a good night. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.